Hello. A couple quick reminders. One, please turn off your cell phones. Uh, two, don't forget to fill out your survey if you like the talk. <laughs> if you don't like it, don't fill it out. <laughs> Just kidding, fill it out either way. Um, and three, I would like to acknowledge that uh, we are currently, in being in the San Francisco Bay Area, we're occupying uh, indigenous Ohlone land. Uh, just a quick something to be aware of. And then before we get started, a quick note. Um, you know, just it's a perilous time that we live in right now in the United States. Um, you know, fascism is creeping in, and the Muslim travel ban, as well as the proposed, proposed border wall, I think are xenophobic bullshit. And I just wanna take a second to appreciate what a privilege it is for all of us to be able to come to this conference and to talk about games and to think about this. There's a lot of developers who perhaps don't feel safe coming to this country and for very good reason. And it upsets me that the current climate in this country and institutionalized racism is discriminating against fellow game developers from being here as well as fellow human beings. Uh, with that being said, hi. This is Level Flow for a video game mixtape. I am Akuma, there is my couple social media handles. I um, also have a hashtag. If you want to live tweet any of this, you can use hashtag GDC mixtape. Um, you can see there, I made a game called Freaking Weekend, or I'm finishing up at the moment. Um, we showed it at, at Indicate last year, um, and I'll talk more about that and how it works with video game mixtapes shortly. Quick couple notes about myself. Uh, I'm from Los Angeles. I'm an LA native. I'm part of a collection, a group of a uh, community of indie game developers called Quitch City. And I've been making games for about three and a half years now. And I'm also alumni of USC, the University of Southern California, specifically the School of Cinematic Arts, uh, their inter interactive media and games MFA graduate program. So when we, hopefully a lot of you saw the title, Video Game Mixtape, and we're kind of intrigued by that. So we wonder, what is a video game mixtape? Uh, and perhaps one day we'll have a vocabulary that doesn't rely on antiquated media to talk about games and what we're doing, but for now it's fun to explore that. So I would say that a video game mixtape is an intentional collection of mini games, and the sum is greater than its parts. Uh, I have mini games in quotation marks because I feel like the term mini game is a little problematic. Mini is inherently inferior, and it reinforces this capitalist idea that the value of a game is related to its length. Uh, I do like the term vignette games, but video game mixed games aren't necessarily made of all vignettes, so for now we'll just stick with mini games. Uh, so here's our track listing. Um, you can see we got through the intro. We're going currently through what is a video game mixtape, and I have a couple other tracks here. Um, so we got some good stuff for you. Um, and before we go deeper, let's perhaps take a step back and think what is a mixtape. I think most of you here are old enough to have experience whether it's uh, on a cassette tape form or a CD, some form of mixtape. But basically, you would record your favorite songs onto a tape or a CD. Um, perhaps you record them off the radio or from another tape or from a computer. Um, but it took a, a while to make this physical media, so you put a lot of thought into it. Uh, and though I do want to see games that bring together works from a bunch of different authors, I think that'd be kind of hard because every th code, the code that everyone used to make games, it's all separate. So compiling that would be very difficult. And besides, I'm a little bit more interested in looking at the modern hip hop mixtape. Uh, so here's a few hip hop mixtapes from the last uh, couple of years. And hip hop, hip -hop mixtape, typically you have a rapper who is um, you know, rapping on every track and they have guest producers, they have featured artists, they have other um, musicians in. And you know, these guys are recording, and I mean, they're recording you know, dozens of songs, so you can put together a mixtape to show off your skills, to build up hype for your commercial album that you're gonna uh, release, uh, and really to show off your practice and your hustle and your progress. And I think that's a really cool um, model to uh, look at when we think about games. So how could we adapt this, this format? Um, well, thankfully, it falls in line with, um, I don't know if you've seen this Ira Glass. He's a, um, a DJ with NPR, and he talks about, um, you know, we have this skills gap where we have taste, good taste in games, as I'm sure a lot of you here have. Um, but the things that we make when we start, they're not quite as good as what we, what we like to think of. Um, so he advocates just making a high volume of work in order to close that gap. And then it also falls in line with what, uh, this is Adriel and Rami, two people I met uh, my first year at USC, and they were talking about doing a game a week. So this idea that you make one game per week, and at the end of the week you toss out, um, well not toss out, but you just 
competently abandon what it is that you made, but it's just, you're rapidly making things going through this process. Uh, you know, think of the idea, prototype it, test it, make it, refine it, repeat. Um, and I think that that's, you know, really falls in line with this idea of video game mixtapes. Um, so that's what I did. I had to make a game while I was at USC for my thesis. I had a year to put together a project. So I, instead of making one, I decided I'm gonna make you know, dozens. I'm just gonna make a bunch of little things and allow that to build up my process. Uh, and then you can see I tied it together in this mobile phone interface and all these little icons represent the different apps. Um, and in some ways too, this is my rapper struggle album. You know, just very much, you know, struggling financially, uh, going through school, being a long distance relationship. A lot of things were going on at that time in my life. So, you know, this is sort of therapy uh, in the form of art. So, you know, making a lot of things, and I perhaps took that a little bit too much to heart. Um, here's my Unity project folder where there's just tons and tons of projects. And I actually counted recently, and in the last year, outside of Freaking Weekend, which is my, um, my thesis, I've made like 20 other game projects, or 28 depending on how you cut them, which is like crazy to me. And not all of them have been released. A lot of them are just kind of like really solid prototypes. But again, it just speaks to this um, method of practice to, to improve our skills. Um, but a couple notes, if you are gonna make a video game mixtape, you would want, rather than this, to have all of your games inside of one project folder. Um, and make sure your naming schemes are tight because a lot of times I just rely on typing to search for the files that I want. As well as um, don't fear short game experiences, especially when you're making a mix. Uh, this is Joey Ramone from the punk band The Ramones. Um, and a lot of punk, band, punk rock songs can be very short, but we don't really call them like mini songs, right? Uh, we, they're just songs, it's just music. Um, and there's a nice quote that I like where someone asked uh, Joey Ramone about why the Ramone songs are all so fast, and he said, or uh, why they're all so short. And he said, we actually play very long songs, but we just play them very fast. Um, so I love it, I love that he flips it, it's all relative anyways, um, what does it matter? We should just make what we wanna make. Uh, this is the Freaking Weekend Inspirations mix. Um, you might recognize some of these games. I'm not gonna go into all of them, but a lot of these games have this sort of um, mix feel to it or a uh, variety of gameplay. Or you know, The gameplay a lot of times is really relaxed as well, so it's not like you run the risk of losing or failing or not getting it. As you play, you're gonna get through a lot of these experiences or they do something w interesting with music or sound. And for me, I realized that a lot of these influence my style um, to not just make experimental work, but things that are experiential. So it's about the metaphor of what it is that you're doing, um, but we wanna use simple and fun mechanics to do that. So we're gonna use the language of gameplay. We're gonna use the language of feedback and juiciness and teaching our player different things in order to have them do these kind of metaphors. Um, and then the secret for video game mixtape is before the player gets bored or when the, normally when the difficulty would increase, uh, we just move on to the next game. And that was side A. Here we're gonna flip over the tape. And move on to the B side, uh, where we got Freaking Weekend, Lumpo, and Spooky Game Snacks. Um, some other examples that we can look at. Here's our updated track listing. And actually there's a typo, six and eight should be flipped. Um, but never mind that. Um, but yeah, Freaking Weekend, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, this is my video game mixtape, um, my most personal one. Uh, you can see it's in a mobile phone interface, and when people play it, it's like you're going through someone's phone, or perhaps you're performing as me. So a little bit intentionally vague as to who the player is when they're playing this, but you know it's very much using the affordances of the phone. Uh, and I wanna look at first a couple of micro examples of level design of what I made, and then we'll look at the macro of how they all fit together. Um, so here's an example, I'm sure a lot of you have you know, relate to coding and making games uh, using Unity perhaps. Um, and so this game, I just sort of copied my setup from home and you know, you can type on, if you look at the bottom phone, you can see you just typing on the keyboard and the text shows up. So very much just about, you know, the joy of typing, uh, if you can get into typing code. But you know, so you can't type anything wrong, you just type this um, text shows up and then you can move on to the next level to ask if you wanna save it and then you can, um, move from there, and a lot of this, these games that I made is just reflecting on my life, thinking if this was a game, if this was, what would the mechanics be? What would the player be doing? What, what type of emotion would I want to tell doing this? Uh, I made another game about uh, meditation. I went to this Buddhist meditation retreat a couple years back, and it had a pretty big impact on me, talking about mindfulness and breathing. Uh, if you time your breathing to that gif up the, the top, if you feel anxious or whatever, it can help you to just relax, so I thought, how can we turn that into 
a game and gameplay mechanics. So we thought of this idea where you're touching the screen and you're growing this circle sort of similar to what the shape is doing. And then we put some mantras of people, what they meditate, could meditate to, thinking about in the back of your head, uh, as well as some fun visuals um, to really show, you know, to convey and teach this mindfulness uh, breathing mechanic, if you will, but the player is actually doing the physical breathing while they're touching the screen. Uh, I made a Gamergate game uh, about you know Twitter, what it's like to have a Twitter hate mob descending on you, because when I was working on uh, this project, that was definitely hap going on. Um, I haven't, uh, so in this game, you can swipe to move the camera, and when you look at these little anime and game avatars, they like cuss at you and say really mean things to you. Um, and I wanted to create this sort of audio assault for the players. So as they clear a certain number of them, or as they clear them, more show up, and as they clear a certain number of them, I have different things that trigger, different audio things to make the player feel paranoid, different things that I do to the environment to really ramp up that, that tension. Um, and I thankfully have not been the subject of a Twitter hate mob, but back in the day I wrote a blog um, about this game that had sort of racist imagery in it, and you know, a bunch of people descended on the comments and said you know, pretty awful things. Uh, one of my favorites was someone saying, uh, fuck Alejandro Quan Madrid, that's my legal name, but this is from PSP Gamer 619. And I think it's funny because it's 619 and not 69, like, I don't know. I, I think it's funny now to look back at it, but at the time, too, it, it didn't feel good. It felt pretty awful because I was like, oh, my career's ruined. I can never work in the games industry again, but obviously that's not true. Um, but you know, how do we express that feeling? How do we convey that to a player in, in gameplay? In, a couple other examples is um, I have a game where you're rolling a joint and you're breaking up weed and you blow it out the window. Uh, and if you live at home with your mom, that's what you do when you don't want her to smell it, is you blow the smoke out the window. So I wanted to put that in a game. I have another one at the bottom. You can see um, you're rotating this phone. And as you rotate, it, it's like a kaleidoscope and the different shapes move. Um, that's my 94 Civic in there. And um, you, know, you can tap on the diamonds. Tacos will show up at some point. Um, just, it's a music toy. So as you rotate it, different notes will play and a beat's playing. So it's really much just um, you know, like a music video almost. And it's a way that I could also make an homage to driving without actually building a driving engine and having a whole driving game, because that's way too much work. Um, as well as I have here messages. Um, a lot of these are actually from my phone at the time when I made this. Like, oh, what were the latest? responses and messages I had with my friends and I put those in there. But it's done to do world building because people might read those snippets and be like, oh, I wonder what that was about. So it creates this whole sense of world, even though I don't go through like explaining or you know, resolving some of those things. It's just to kind of make everything feel a little bit more believable, as well as I can put in different you know, um, ARG or different you know, mini games where you're messaging people back and forth and different story elements we can reveal that way. And they also have the little star button at the bottom, and that's how you can navigate back to the level select screen. So some of the games, they kind of channel you through, and some of them you can um, press it, and it'll knock you back to here. This is my level select screen. All right, so we made this example, but I made a bunch of pieces. Now what do we do with them? Uh, this is Sergei Eisenstein, who is a Soviet filmmaker and film theorist. Uh, so you talk about this thing called montage, and there's other names for it now, or people think of montage as being something different, but the idea is that the order that people see different images in film will affect what they, how they interpret it. The preceding image will influence what they think of the next one, et cetera. So we can use that to our advantage. Uh, humans, like we love stories. We love hearing stories, we love telling stories, we love thinking stories and figuring things out. Um, and that's great, because then we can just put out these different elements and the player, when they play through them, they're going to start to figure out, OK, what's the story? What's going on here? So we don't have to be explicit about it as designers. We can have it be intentionally vague and still have like a general idea of what we want it to be, but we don't have to be explicit with it. So it's great because it gives you a lot of freedom. Um, but yeah, montage. So we can take like the uh, coding game here. And in the game, after you test the game, a phone pops up and you look at it. And it knocks you. Or now you're playing the game, or you're testing the one that you are supposedly working on. Um, and you can see this one's you know, sort of modeled after uh, Space Harrier and Star Fox and some of these other games. Um, and this one, so if we look at the action beats, the typing one's kind of fun, but it's kind of a lull too because you're just kind of exploring this little space. And then this other game where you're flying, there's a really nice song that plays and there's all this sort of more action and it's intentionally a little bit more gamey in that there's like a combo meter and like money, but at the end there's a surprise twist where I flip it on its head. Uh, so we have this fun uh, transition and now we have a little bit more action going on. So how do we move from this to another game? 
Uh, well, since we're using a mobile phone, what I do is I have a little um, notification pop down to tell you that, oh, people responded to your message on the Twitter, or as I call it, Critter app. It's like creepy Twitter, so it's Critter as opposed to Twitter. But um, let you know that that's been updated, so when you tap on that um, banner, it then opens up the Twitter app. And then now we go from having you know a higher um, state of tension a little bit to now we ramp it up dramatically. So the player's now getting really intense. I've had people say how affecting uh, playing this was because you're just hearing all this negative um, things being said to you. And even though it's not like personalized explicitly towards each player, there's still that feeling where people internalize it. Um, so it's like, oh, okay, now I have the player in this sort of heightened state. What do we do with that? Because how do you, what do you go to next that doesn't seem kind of trivial or doesn't, isn't kind of weird? So it seemed obvious to then go to the meditation game afterwards. Um, and I like that because it gives the player a tool that they can use to come down from um, not just like a literal tool in the game, but also like an internal tool that they can use to you know, sort of recollect themselves. At one point I had a jump cut that took you from the Twitter game to the meditation game, but people found that to be very disorienting, especially when they're trying to process all this sort of negativity that's happening. So instead I had another banner that pops down to tell you, oh, your meditation app has been updated, so now you can tap on that to go, or if you go back to the um, title screen, the meditation app will be available as a new icon for you to try out when you're ready. So creating that space in between the apps was really important to give the player a little bit room to process a little bit room to breathe. And then it's also like traditional game design where you have a really intense gameplay uh, moment, so you might have something where you're in a town or you're doing something that's much more relaxed to sort of balance out those more intense moments. It can't be intense all the time. Um, so you know, we want to take into consideration what's the emotional arc of the player. Another example, so we have this weed smoking, roll in a joint, a light puzzle game, which is actually like a lot of work to make this one because apparently not everyone knows how to roll a joint. Some people didn't feel comfortable doing it. Um, yeah, so I thought it was just funny, um, but it was a lot of little tricks I had to put in here to sort of teach people how to do that. Um, and after you, you know, roll it, it goes into first person, and you can look around the room, you find the phone, you pick up the phone, and it goes into the driving game. So, you know, now this question, this is kind of more psychedelic game, so is the player high right now? Am I high right now? And you're playing as me? Um, you know, it's intentionally vague, but, you know, there is some, I do want you to think, you know, that the weed effects uh, carry over into the next one. And then midway, when you're playing through this, you know, this psychedelic driving game, um, I decided to interrupt it with a phone call from mom. So then you have to talk to my mom, uh, and you have, you know, little chances or options of what you can say to respond. Um, and I thought that was kind of funny, because, like, who's going to want to play a game? Hey, you want to play a video game where you talk to my mom on the phone? Like, that sounds really stupid, right? <laughs> or not stupid, but, like, you know, you're not going to maybe, only a special type of gamer might be initially interested in that. So I thought, how can we trick people into having this conversation? Well, we can bait and switch them. You start off with a weed game. Hey, that's fun. This is funny. Look at me. I'm rolling a joint. You know, oh, cool. Now it's all trippy and psychedelic. Oh, shit. Like, I've had people play the game and then hand me the phone when the, it looks like it's ringing because they thought that someone was calling me. But it's like, I don't know. That's part of the game. Keep playing. You know, so you kind of trick them into doing this. And then most people then would say, oh, it was really like kind of boring, but not boring in a bad way, but in the way that it actually does feel when you talk to your parents and they're telling you all these things and you're just trying to get move the conversation along. Um, so that was like a fun way to transition between those. Um, and then a secret slide here, the work in progress. Um, so I have a video chat one that's more just about the frustrations of video chat. Um, so you can see that as one. Number two is sort of this uh, sex stream that I had uh, or that I wanted to make, or actually it was like a sex scene, but I wanted it to be about consensual sex. I wanted it to be like healthy uh, relationships and stuff like that. But I thought, how can I work this into this game? Because it seems kind of out of left field. So my thought was, what if we have, um, you know, this scene where you're doing a video chat, and then when we jump into that one, um, it's implied that it's more of a dream, because then it puts it more about myself and like what the I'm thinking, as opposed to, you know, suggesting that it's with my partner or something else, because that's a little bit weird. Um, and then after that scene, we go into where you're in the room, you're by yourself, and then you see a helicopter outside, because for any of you that live in the hood, a lot of times it's not uncommon to wake up in the middle of the night to a helicopter circling around your neighborhood looking for somebody. Uh, so that was like an emotional beat that I wanted to put in as well to kind of switch up the flow. 
And then the last scene, um, I'm working with my friend Paloma Dawkins, and we're doing this sort of like mini adventure game, and it's not, you know, just one scene, and there's things you can click on, there's dialogue, and you know, a little bit of a sense of progression. And this is an example, too, of when you make video game mixtapes, what you can do, or at least when you're making these sort of short vignettes, is as a designer, I can build out the system. She actually just drew a bunch of sketches when we were hanging out, and then I chopped up those sketches and put those in just so you can see what the game's gonna look like. Um, so then I'm building out a lot of the pieces and then showing it back to her and then she comes back in and puts the art in. And that's kind of the beauty too is because when you're making these small pieces, I'm not asking an artist, hey, do you want to commit to my project for the next two years and do all the art for it? No, hey, do you want to come in and do your magic on this one piece and just do a couple of drawings and I can make them work and do, um, you know, make it work for what we're trying to do. Um, but yeah, it's, that's another chapter. Um, here's the update and there's a few other examples that I want to look at. Um, this is Lumpo. This is a game that I made with a very talented artist, uh, Amy, Amy Huang, and she did some of the art on Freaking Weekend. Uh, so for here, we went through a similar process, and she kind of got what I was doing with the Freaking Weekend as a mixtape, so she kind of went in and did her own thing. Um, so we have these vignettes. You can see you're putting stickers on the phone, and it's like a gift from somebody. Oh, it's about, we made this for the Yuri Game Jam, so it's about, you know, unrequited love or... Uh, yeah, you know, attraction crushes between two people or two youth. Um, so when they're, t you know, uh, watching TV and as you click on the TV to change the channels, it progresses the dialogue. Uh, and then the bottom one, you can see you click on the cap bottle caps, they fly around. And all these mechanics were kind of driven by this idea of being in the suburbs and being bored and how can we build a game around that. So we just got together and jammed and knocked each of these pieces out. Um, this one's a little bit different though because it doesn't really require a certain order. Freaking Weekend, I do want you to play every piece in a certain order for the montage to make sense. But this one, they're a little bit more freeform. So you have, we have this order that we want you to play them in that where we list the apps on the top right um, from top to bottom. But you know, any order that you played in doesn't really matter. A lot of people have done Let's Play videos and it's kind of cool to see people explore them in different orders, but everyone kind of gets the same themes and the same ideas after they played a couple of them. Oh, okay, I'm starting to get what that, what that means. Um, and this is available on itch.io if you want to download it, it's free. Lumpo, L-U-M-P-O. Uh, and this is also on itch. This is Spooky Game Snacks EP. So I made a bunch of little short, uh, I did this for Gametober, something that I, I guess I made up, but Inktober, people were doing in October, drawing a, drawing a day, so I thought it'd be kind of fun, what if we made a game a day? And not like a crazy game, but like a one button game, a one interaction game. Uh, so the first one is Pumpkin Butt, that's in the top left corner. And that one, uh, you tap on the pumpkin and it explodes. It's called Pumpkin Butt because I'm not a good modeler, so I couldn't make it look like a real pumpkin inside, so because it looked all around, oh, we'll just change the title, it's called Pumpkin Butt, and that's intentional. Um, but that one, you know, you just press it, it squishes, makes a really good sound, um, but it's just kind of like on or off, and it's juicy, but you know, there's not a lot of room for player exploration. Uh, so we have Candy Corn is Gross, which is in the top right corner, where you're just clicking around, and you can throw Candy Corn in the trash, where it belongs, or you could throw it on the floor or in other places. Um, and you can see in the t bottom corner, I have these arrows, so rather than having this force progression, when you're ready to move on from this game to the next one, you can click on the arrow and it'll move you along. Um, the bottom left one is um, Coco de Paleta, which is a Po uh, coconut popsicle, Mexican popsicle. And when I made this in October, it was like 85 degrees in Los Angeles, so it's like super hot and it doesn't feel like autumn at all, but I thought it'd be funny to have a, you know, a little snack break halfway between uh, these five pieces. And then afterwards, uh, the fourth one is uh, Spider Friend, and that one, you're talking to the spider and then you realize it lives in your ear and it's kind of gross, but you know, a chance to kick up the narrative a little bit more. So one, it's just kind of this, um, the pumpkin to draw you in, the candy corn to make it more playful and give you more room for self-expression, the paleta to kind of take a break where you click and it just eats itself and then it falls, the spider one to have a little bit of a narrative kick where all of a sudden it's like, uh-oh, now what's going on? And then the last one, I call it a uh, glitch kitty, and that one you play as a cat on a broomstick flying over this world and you can wave magic in the air and my friend Clover in Sea Life did a really great song for it. It's about a 45 second song and at the end we fade out to the title. So I really like it because I feel like it's a nice crescendo and climax and we have this song that sort of caps off everything and really does make it feel like um, what I call an EP, which would be an extended play in music, but you know, for our intents and purposes, it's a, another video game mixtape. And a lot of these ideas stem from uh, this guy, or at least I take insp inspiration from this guy. This is uh, Gunpei Yokoi, who designed uh, the Game Boy and the Virtual Boy, and he's a uh, working for an worked for Nintendo, uh, late late designer. But um, 
he talked about lateral thinking with withered technology. And that's this idea that we have all this technology available to us now, it's cheap, it's accessible, we all know how to use Unity, there's lots of documentation. Uh, our players, they know how to play screen-based games, they know how to play games on their phone. Uh, so if everything's so accessible, and affordable, then we should think laterally of what kind of stories we want to tell. Let's use it to tell stories in innovative and new ways that people haven't done yet, rather than always chasing the cutting edge. Everyone's going to always you know, chase after that. If you saw the line for the VR talk next door, it's like down over to the bathroom. But you know, I'm very grateful for all of you to be here with me. Um, you know, so VR is like super expensive for developers as well as for consumers. So if we stick to um, withered technology, um, you know, we can make things that are certainly more accessible to the larger group of people. Uh, so to wrap up, a couple keys to video game mixtapes. Uh, one is to embrace the creative freedom. Um, so as you make it, you can just make whatever you want. Just make a bunch of little pieces. And, you know, you can figure out what it's going to be as you make them. You might notice trends in your art or what you're interested in. And you'll figure out the order as you make it. I, some of these seem like they're well planned out, but it's not. I just made a bunch of things that I thought would be kind of cool, and then I figured out later how can we start piecing them together because I had to show some work uh, to my class. Okay, let's just, I have three. Let's just piece them together and come up with a retroscript, a story as to why. Um, but just remember that the players are going to figure out, or they're going to make up the connections for you so you don't have to be explicit with it. And it's the diversity of experiences is what's really going to enhance the mix. Uh, two is to keep it flexible and modular. It, the beauty about working in this way is if, like for me, I got like way better every couple months that I was working on this project, so I could just quarantine all the bad code. Like, oh my god, why did I code it this way? Well, it works, so we'll just put that in the corner and not touch it anymore, not build any systems on top of that. But you know, we have this piece that works, and then we'll just make sure the next piece that we do, we're going to code it and organize our, organize our files in a much better way. Um, and if you make something cool later, it doesn't have to be a ton of work to implement it because it's a mix, so you can just add in this cool thing afterwards. Um, as well as, like I mentioned earlier, it's a great way to get collaborator, collaborators to work because you're building these small pieces, and it's much more visible and tangible for them how they would fit in. Oh, I need you to make this art look better. I need you to do a song for this little piece. I need you to do... Um, sound effects or code to make some of these things smoothen out. And there's a lot that we can do, um, you know, to respect people's times, both uh, for our fellow developers as well as for the players. Um, get in, do your thing, and get out. That's a big part of it, right? You don't want to just linger too long on one piece because someone might get bored or, you know, I think it's good to err on the side of caution because you could say, oh, have you played my game? No. Okay, well, it just takes a couple minutes and then you're done versus have you played my game? Cool. Well, it's a 60-hour experience and you can start off uh, in the first town or whatever and, you know, people don't have the time for that. Um, so explore the system of the, each piece that you're making, uh, but keep everything moving so that it stays interesting. And then lastly, especially for younger game developers, uh, trust that the process will build your style and your game development chops. You know, we're doing repetitions here, we're making things, we're making a lot of things, and we're not really concerned about the outcome of how good they are, if they're gonna make a lot of money or anything. We're just focused on this small little piece. But it's like, you know, making an overscoped game or any game that we think is regularly scoped is like running a marathon. And for a lot of like, younger developers, it's like, well, have you ever worked out before? Have you ever exercised before? No, but I think if I run hard enough, I can just like make it work, right? Like, no, running a marathon, I don't think works that way, right? You have to work up to it. So I really believe in this process to build your chops, to build your style, because things are going to emerge as you start to, after you get to like the 20th thing that you've made, you're going to like, oh, I have a style now. Um, here's the updated track listing. Just have a quick outro for you. Um, a year ago, I showed this at the Indie, or I showed Freaking Weekend at LA Zine Fest, and a uh, a journalist said to me that uh, it was the most immersive experience he had. He said, it is wildly creative in how it deconstructs the traditional video game experience. I also think it speaks compellingly to each player's personal life and modernity, though it is autobiographical. There's also an aspect of voyeurism to the game that is magnetic. And he sent me this, and I'm just like, wow, that sounds great. <laughs> sure, like that sounds wonderful. Like this is my game, okay. Um, and I think it just kind of it's validating for what I did because again, I just made all these pieces and started to string them together, and then he was able to absorb and abstract all this meaning from it. And it's very much intentional, but it just you know when you're knee deep in it, it doesn't really seem like some of these things will come across. But he got it. Uh, and my other favorite hot take on Freaking Weekend is when I showed it at Indicate last year. A, a Japanese game journalist played it and asked if he wanted to write about it after playing. And it was mainly in regards to the weed scene. But he said, uh, maybe if I wrote about your game, I would be fired. 
And I thought that was great because, um, you know, not that the game is bad, but it's like, oh, cool, I'm doing something. I'm doing something that's provoking people, doing something that might be controversial. And I think that, you know, in terms of v making video game mixtapes, there's a lot of room there for people to explore. So thank you. If you make a video game mixtape, please send it to me. I would love to play it and see you know, how you interpret some of these ideas. I think that some of what I'm talking about here is very much influenced by a lot of my colleagues in Los Angeles and other people that I've met. So, you know, but video games, the beautiful thing is it's global. So I wanna see what you have to say and what you have to make. Um, if you wanna also have an update when Freaking Weekend's out, you can go to freakingweekend.com and I have a mailing list, you can leave me your email and I will get back to you when it's done. Uh, do we have time for no questions? One question? Any questions? You don't have to. One, are you gonna ask a question? Yes. No, I just, I just wanna rap. You wanna uh, rap? No. Do you need a beat? Have you ever thought about doing this in the context of uh, Glitch City where maybe you guys independently assemble some sort of, I guess it wouldn't be a mixtape as much as like, a greatest, uh, like a now what you call, this is what you call music kind of thing. I've, I've thought about it. It's kind of hard though because everyone's sort of doing their own thing and time is money. So it's hard yeah. to ask people to step away from their, their main project to work on something like this. But that's why I think if I did a lot of the work and just kind of had them come in and just do something for a couple hours, that could work. Another idea that I want to explore is doing a um, beautiful corpse, is that what they're called? So just have a Unity project open and everyone can just take turns going up to it and doing adding something to it. Um, so that's like the closest I've thought of it. but. You know, in the future, as I think as some of this is more explored and more mainstream, hopefully, then more people will get it and want to, you know, put time into it and we can figure out ways to make it work. So thank you. Uh, but yeah, thank you everybody for listening, for being here. I hope you have a great rest of your conference and fill out your surveys. Thank you. <laughs>